This morning we're looking at uh, John chapter 1, beginning at verse 15. It says, John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received in grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. This is the testimony of John when Jesus sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you so that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him and said to him, why then are you baptizing if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord God, we thank you for this testimony of John the Baptist, that he was that one prophesied by Isaiah, who would make way, make the way straight for Christ who would come. Lord God, help us to be prepared for when Christ comes back. Lord, teach us from your word what we need to know and what would help us, Father God, to be the best representatives of our Savior that we can be. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, for many centuries, the people of Israel had been longing and looking for the promised Messiah who would redeem them from the curse of evil and from the inevitable consequences that sin brings. A man appeared on the scene, chosen and endowed by God to prepare the way for the coming Messiah. And he was to do this by gathering around himself a group of people who by disposition would be prepared to be the followers and co-workers with the Messiah. The piety of this man, John the Baptist, was so eminent that many people took him to be the Messiah. They thought, well, this must be the Messiah. Again and again they came and asked if he was the promised one, the anointed one, the one about whom the prophets had spoken. And again and again John the Baptist denied that he was that individual. He, he introduced himself simply as a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. He's what came before the Messiah. He challenged people to turn away from the love of evil and to turn to the way of personal faith and righteousness. And, and those who heeded his messages were therefore prepared for the appearance of that Messiah that had been promised. Our Lord Jesus Christ, after living the first 30 years of his life in the city of Nazareth, went to John for baptism. Immediately following his baptism, he was led by the Spirit of God into the wilderness to be tested, to be tempted by the evil one. After our Savior overcame these temptations and demonstrated his superiority to the power of Satan, we find him coming to John the Baptist again. When when John the Baptist saw Jesus approaching, he said to his disciples who were gathered around him here in this final verse of our text this morning, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This very descriptive phrase, Lamb of God, came straight from the heart of the Old Testament prophets. From the book of Genesis through the, the Psalms and prophets, the Messiah is frequently spoken of as the Lamb of God, God's Lamb. The lamb, you'll remember, was the animal of sacrifice by which atonement was made for sin. 
The ceremonial death of the Lamb was a picture in which people's sin would be covered and removed and, and they would be forgiven through the blood, ultimately, of Christ. To the hearts of John's disciples, this phrase, the Lamb of God, had a significance that it wouldn't have for modern-day man on the street. If, if someone were to appear today and say, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, people just wouldn't understand it. The announcement of John contained eternal and timeless truth. Only those who are prepared to hear it can receive it. In one sentence, he stated the need of man and the provision of God. Even for us today, the imperative of John the Baptist calls to us through the, through the quarters of time. And there is nothing that we need more today than to behold the Lamb of God who takes away our sin. Consider with me this morning the Lamb of God came because of sin. The reason God sent His only Son, His Lamb, was because of sin. We assemble from Sunday to Sunday in classroom and sanctuary in order that with the eye of our soul we might behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is a sight of which the eyes never grow tired. This is a sight that can always bless the heart, challenge the mind, and sway the will, and, and deepen the faith. So today it is my prayer that, that somehow, during our service, you might be able to see God's Lamb, to behold the Lamb of God, who takes away your sin and my sin, and the world's sin. In this statement, the sin of the world, John the Baptist was speaking about the world's greatest problem. The issue that we all face. There are many superficial diagnoses of, of what ails the world today. Some people believe that through education, the ills of humanity can be eliminated. Certainly the value of a good education isn't to be underestimated. Others believe that, that the solution to our problems here in America has to do with solving our immigration issues because of all the crime elements that come across the southern border, but Congress seems to be locked in inactivity about that. Others say our biggest problem is poverty, and, and we need to find ways that, where we can renew our urban centers and eliminate the abandoned buildings and, that are a constant breeding place for crime and homelessness and drug abuse. Definitely something needs to be done about those things. Others would say the greatest problem in the world today is the threat of terrorism. And we hear uh, others clamor about guns and all the mass shootings that we've seen. Somehow we need to recognize that these issues or, or problems are but the outcroppings of something that's deeper. Something more significant. The heart of our problem is sin. Amen? When, when many of us think in terms of sin, we think about this, you know, this little thing or that little thing or a particular act or attitude. We fail to recognize that these are just the fruit of a heart conditioned by sin. Our heart has a condition of sin. John the Baptist didn't say, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He went deeper than that. Jesus came to deal with the core of the problem that plagues all of us. He came to take away the sin of the world. When, when John pointed to Jesus, he was pointing to the one who came to deal with our deepest need. The primary need of the world. What is the greatest need of your heart and life today? Young people may, may say, well, my greatest need is to finish all my college, college education. Another person may say, my greatest need is financial. I need money to pay off my debts. Couples experiencing marital difficulties may say that peace and harmony in the home is the greatest need they have. The alcoholic or drug addict solution to their problems just, just adds more problems to their life as they, they dive deeper into drug and alcohol abuse. But the truth is that while we may not use drugs or alcohol, we use other things like recreation or sports or food or entertainment, all of these things can be used as diversions to keep us from dealing with that root problem. <coughs> when we take all these problems and, and analyze them and, and looking at ourselves as we really are, we, we come to realize that behind our uneasiness, behind all of, of, of our frustrations and our, our failures, behind our shortcomings, 
is this thing called sin, this little three little letter word. It's not just a question of if, if the wife would do this or the husband would do that, everything would be all right. It's not merely if the son would quit doing this or the daughter would start doing something else, then everything would just be perfect in our home. All of us need to recognize that our greatest need is for a solution to our sin problem. Only Jesus Christ can deal with this problem adequately and, and only He can solve this problem for the world, for our nation, for your home, and for your individual life. If, if a man has skin cancer and considers it merely as a, a mild skin rash, he's in danger. He is laboring under an illusion if he's treating cancer as though it were just a rash. Often we fail to diagnose what our problem really is and consequently we don't know how to treat it or, or we just don't worry about treating it. John the Baptist would point us to Him who alone can deal with the deepest need of our lives. Jesus Christ came into this world not just to live a beautiful life or to spout out some pious platitudes. He didn't come into the world merely to heal the sick and give sight to the blind and restore hearing to the deaf and make the lame walk. Jesus came into this world primarily to deal with my sin problem and your sin problem. You recall the angel said to Joseph concerning Mary, She will bear a son, he said, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus himself said, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Paul wrote to the Romans, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so we see that in dealing with sin, the Lamb of God takes away the punishment of sin. Sin has never been a popular subject. Nobody wants to talk about it. Well, please don't preach about it because we'd rather kind of forget about that thing. It, it's a negative subject and people don't like to hear about it. Yet it's the problem with which all of us must deal and all of us need to find a solution for that problem. Jesus Christ came into this world to take care of the sin problem and to help us with the biggest problems that we have. He came into the world that He might bear the punishment for our sins. Ezekiel 18.4, we find these words, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins will die. But we know Romans 6, 23, that for the wages of sin is death. What will be paid because of our sin is death. It is possible to sin. We can make that choice. But it is impossible to sin without suffering. Jesus Christ came into this world to suffer for our sins in the sense in which our sins separate us from God. He, he went to the cross and suffered condemnation, isolation, agony, death as a substitute for us that He might bear the punishment for our sin. 1 Peter 3.18 says it this way, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that He might bring us to God having been put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the Spirit. Our only hope of escaping a Christless, eternal, hopeless eternity is through the fact that Jesus Christ loved us to the extent that He died in our place on the cross. He took the rap for you and me, in other words. He suffered in our place, and you, you and I should behold the Lamb suffering the unutterable, uh, agony and, and anguish on the cross for us. Personally, for us. Scriptures tell us that Jesus died for our sins. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. His death on the cross wasn't an accident in the plan of God. His death on the cross wasn't the death of an apostle of of some lost cause. It was not God's emergency plan. It was the plan of God that Jesus Christ should demonstrate 
God's immeasurable love by dying in my place and in your place because of our sin. Sometimes we forget that Jesus died for our sin. We behold, gaze upon, focus your attention upon Him who gave you know, and came to take away the sin of the world. Meditate on that. He took away the punishment for our sin, that, that punishment that would separate us from God for eternity by dying on the cross in my place and in your place. Next, consider this morning that the Lamb of God takes away the power of sin. The power of sin. The Lamb of God comes into our hearts to take away that power and to deliver us from the practice of sin and from the evil nature within us. To change us, transform us. Romans 6.14, it says, For God shall not be, for sin, rather, for sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. <coughs> Excuse me. We're not to be slaves of sin. God wouldn't be a good God if He placed within our hearts a hunger and a thirst for a holy life, but He didn't also make available to us the resources and the strength to enable us to live that holy life. And, and so Jesus Christ came into this world that He might deliver us from the power of the practice, and the habit of sin. He does this by means of His church. It's the plan and purpose of God that every one of His disciples be a part of the church, a participant in church, a community of the redeemed, a family of the forgiven, a fellowship of the twice-born, it's been called, a group in whom the Holy Spirit dwells, a people who practice the law of love and live by the rule of mercy and mutual help and encouragement. The church is a part of God's plan to deliver us from the power of sin. Also, our Lord will deliver us from the power of sin through His Bible, His Holy Word. You can't be victorious over the evil within you and you, and you can't escape the evil that is around you if you're a stranger to the pages of that blessed book. If you don't memorize its truths and hide them in your heart, if you don't feast your soul upon it as daily food, Psalm 119.9 tells us, how can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. A little further down here in Psalm 119, verse 11, we find these words, your word have I, I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. I learned it in the King James. Thy word have I hidden in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. As you take the, the precious divine living word of God and make it a part of your, your way of life, you'll, you'll find that this is God's way of helping you live that victorious life. And as we study that word from God, we discover how God has destroyed the power of sin in our lives as we've immersed our lives in His word. Jesus didn't stay in the grave. He didn't deserve death. He was without sin. Therefore, the arms of death couldn't hold Him. And, and so Jesus rose on the third day, conquering sin and death, thus giving us that sure and certain hope of forgiveness of our sins and eternal life in heaven with Him. The poet has expressed his certainty of this blessed event with these words. How do I know that Christ is risen? What proof have I to give? He touched my life one blessed day and I began to live. How do I know that He left the tomb that morning long ago? I met Him just this morning and my heart is still at well. How do I know that endless life He gained for me that day? His life within is proof enough of immortality. How do I know that Christ still lives rich blessings to impart? He walks with me along the way, lives within my heart. Behold the risen Lamb of God, given all power over sin and death, and us the hope of glory. As His followers, with the eye of our faith, let us behold God's Lamb, adore Him, love Him, admire Him, obey Him, 
Let us behold Him and not only adore Him, but let's decide to serve Him lovingly and obediently. If you haven't yet done that, fasten your eyes on Jesus in faith to trust and receive Him as your Savior. He wants to be your Savior, your teacher, your friend and guide. Your, your decision to receive Him will permit Him to take away the sin that separated you from God. And then enable you to begin that life of obedience, faith, and conquer that sin. But we're going to sing a final song. I know that my Redeemer lived. lived. If you need to make a decision for him this morning, I'll be up here to receive you. Let's all of us, every one of us, think about what does it mean for me to behold the Lamb of God, to envision in my mind's eye Jesus Christ and His love for me, what He's done for me, and then commit myself to serve Him every day and to tell the story so that others can hear of what Jesus has done to save us from our sin. Let's stand together and commit to Him as we sing. <laughs>